Good morning. Happy Reformation. I was just about ready to walk in and somebody said to me, oh, you got all your green on today. I'm like, I'm not supposed to. It was supposed to be red. So I had to go back to the office. <laughs> like, wow, that's the wrong color. Ben, you got some announcements for us today? With the red and green contrast, we may have thought Christmas. Good morning. Just a reminder that our kiosk check-in system is uh, up and running. We have iPads set on either side of the door as you enter in the sanctuary. Um, on Communion Sundays, check both bubbles that you are here at 8 o'clock worship and that you are participating in communion if you are participating in communion. Uh, Bible studies will, our fall section number two of Bible studies will kick off next Sunday. Uh, we will have a few different options again. Downstairs in the fellowship hall, we will have our kids crew. In the youth room with me, we will do a middle school, high school study plus parents, um, breaking barriers. So it's for middle school and high school students plus parents, and that topic is breaking barriers. Uh, Mr. Fonda, our head elder, will be leading a Bible 101 study over in the Omega building. And then Pastor Mike will be leading a study experiencing God also in the Omega building. Then we will have praise team practice here in the sanctuary. All of that starting next Sunday at 930. This Sunday at 930, we encourage everybody to come downstairs to the fellowship hall, uh, get your donut, have some of the confirmation cake, and celebrate with our confirmation students that are being confirmed today in the late service. Uh, we have four students that are being confirmed, so we would love for you to get to go down, congratulate them, celebrate them. Um, that'll be the first half of the time. And then I will steal them away, and for the second half of the time, there will be a shortened Reformation study down there. Um, so head down there at 9.30 or after this service and celebrate, then learn a little bit about Mr. Martin Luther. Our greens sales is taking place. Today is the last Sunday that we will be taking orders for the Christmas greens. Uh, again, this is usually our biggest fundraiser for the National Youth Gathering. Uh, we will be taking a team of 16 total people to Houston this July, uh, so we need all of the greens to be sold as possible, or as many as possible, uh, so stop by the coffee bar afterwards or look for a student with a clipboard to place your order. That can also be placed online by scanning this QR code or following the link in the online TLC. Pastor Mike's book orders and banquet ticket sales, today is the last Sunday for the banquet tickets, I believe, um, so you can swing by the Welcome Center afterwards, uh, Luann's office, or talk to Pastor Mike about those. Elevate for high school students and choir are both this Wednesday at 6.30. Uh, Elevate for high school will be downstairs in the fellowship hall this week. Choir will be here in the sanctuary. And I am so very excited to get to hear them this morning, as many of you are. Uh, family trivia night is uh Friday, November 12th from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. We will have a number of different rounds of trivia, uh, totaling a four, five, three different topics or so. Uh, there will be prizes after each round as well as an overall prize. It will be family, friend, family friendly. Again, that is Friday, November 12th from 5 to 8. And next week, make sure to set your clocks back because we fall back an hour. Now for Mr. Walt Keith. See how classy he had his pinky up the whole time while he's talking? He's super classy. Uh, next Sunday, special voters meeting for the consideration of a, a possible call. Uh, the call committee is going to run most of that. We're also encouraging a time of corporate prayer. Uh, we want to join together as one body and be praying uh, so we're considering fasting. It doesn't have to be uh, food. It doesn't have to be 24 hours. It just needs to be a time where you can humble yourself and remember to pray. Um, I'm giving up uh, for the week Facebook and chocolate. Um, actually, I'm not on Facebook, and I'm allergic to chocolate. <laughs> but I am uh, fasting next Saturday into Sunday. Again, a time to be penitent, humble ourselves, uh, pray for guidance, for wisdom, for discernment as we go into that meeting. So see you next Sunday. Set your clocks back. Thank you. Well, let's stand up and greet one another this morning. Uh. 
Oh. You were in a what? Oh, were you? I didn't know that. <laughs> That's pretty good. I think it's the last one. Yeah, it's the last one. <laughs> All right, let's, uh, let's begin with our first hymn, 655, Lord, keep us steadfast in your word. Fellowship of the Holy Holy Spirit Spirit. be with you all. Let the grass wither, but the word of the Lord. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. In him was life. Light shines in the Sing the next verses of the next hymn.
and light in darkness. To the lie of the devil and the world. We walk in the darkness of false prophets in poor direction. For all our dark thoughts and wayward acts. Let me take a moment of silent confession. Let the words of forgiveness from our God fill our ears. And let the light of the love of Christ shine upon us. For the cross of Jesus drowns out every syllable of sin. And the brightness of our Savior who suffered and died for us cats out every dark shadow of death and the devil. All your sins are forgiven. In the name of the Word made flesh who stands forever for us. You may be seated and we invite the children to come forward for the Okay, we're gonna actually <laughs> he's not yet ready, so I am gonna invite Henning up to do the first reading. We can go on the fly. <laughs> Good morning. The first reading for this morning is written in the book of Proverbs, the 27th chapter, verses 17 to 22. Iron sharpens iron, and one man sharpens another. Whoever tends a fig tree will eat its fruit, and he who guards his master will be honored. As in water, face reflects face, so heart of man reflects the man. Sheol and... Abaddon are never satisfied, and never satisfied are the eyes of man. The crucible is for silver, and the furnace is for gold, and a man is tested by his praise. Crush a fool in a mortar with a pestle along with crushed grain, yet his folly will not depart from him. This is the word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 18th chapter. Peter came up and said to Jesus, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a kingdom who wishes to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees and implored to him, have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii and seized him. He began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servants fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me, and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what he had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all the debt because you pleaded with me and should not 
you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you. And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailer until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. You may be seated and we invite the children to come forward for the children's message. Gates. Good morning. How are you guys? Do you know what today is? Halloween. Mm-mm. <laughs> it's not Halloween. Yes, it is. Uh-uh. Yes. It's a church holiday. It's Reformation Day. You ever heard of Reformation Day? Yeah. Really? That's fantastic. Do you know what Reformation Day is? Do you know who I'm dressed up as? I'm dressed up as Martin Luther. Have you ever heard of Martin Luther? I have. Yeah. What did Martin Luther do? He what? Mm, that's not what he did. He didn't split up the church. Uh-uh. No. Who was Martin Luther? Anybody? What am I dressed up at like? What do I look like? An old person, maybe? (laughs) Martin Luther would be really old today because he lived 500 years ago. And Martin Luther was a Catholic monk. So he was a monk in the church. 500 years ago he lived. Yeah. I don't look that old, do I? Yeah, I do. Well, I look pretty good for 500, I think. Yeah. But anyhow, Martin Luther was a monk in the Catholic church. And Martin Luther... Martin Luther was sad all the time. Yeah, you know why he was sad? Because he thought God was an angry God. And he thought God was mad at him all the time for all the bad things that he thought and did. Yeah. And that's what the church taught in those days, was that God was an angry God. And they taught us, or they taught people like Martin Luther, they taught him that he had to pay for his own sins. Literally, sometimes with money. Yeah. They would collect money and say, if you, if you sinned, you owe the church money. Yeah. And so Martin Luther was sad all the time because he thought God was angry. But he didn't stay sad. You know what he did? He learned to read the Bible. Yeah. Now, that may sound strange to you because can you read the Bible? Yeah. Because it's in English, right? Yeah, it's in all these different languages now. But at Martin Luther's time, it wasn't. There were only a few people that could read the Bible because it was in this language, this old language called Latin. It was really hard to read. And so Martin Luther learned Latin. He learned to read the Bible, and he realized, you know what? God's not an angry God. He's not mad at us all the time. In fact, he loves us. He sent his son Jesus to pay for our sins. We can't pay for our own sins with money or, or with the things that we do. Jesus paid for all our sins. And when Martin Luther realized that, he wasn't sad anymore. And he started telling everybody. And then, that's what happened. Then the church split because they kicked Martin Luther out of the church because they didn't like that. They, they didn't like people knowing the things that Martin Luther was telling them. But Martin Luther didn't go out to, to split up the church. People followed him and they followed his teachings, which were just the Bible. He said, look, It's in the Bible. That's God's word. That's God's love letter to us. Yeah. And so then Martin Luther, he got rid of the money in between us that we would pay for our salvation. He told us that our our salvation is a gift of grace from God. So it's free gift, right? 
He get, and he also told us we didn't need a priest to pray for us. He said, we're all able to just go to God and pray. Like we're going to do in a few minutes. We're going to pray. I'm not going to pray for you. You're going to pray directly to God. The God that loves you. He's not mad at you. He's forgiven all of your sins. And then Martin Luther took the Bible and he translated it. He took that really hard language, Latin, and he translated it in the language that everybody could read so that we could read the Bible for ourselves. Like you can now. Yeah. yeah. Now, Martin Luther did strongly suggest <laughs> that you take him up on that, you take God up on his letter, and you read his letter every day. That's a big deal, right? I mean, if we're able to read God's word, if we're able to talk to God directly, then we have a responsibility to do that, right? To read it. And I know I don't read it as often as I should, but I try, and we should all try to read it every day, because it is God, it's how we know about God. We don't need somebody to tell us. Pastor can help us understand what the Bible says, and other people can help us understand. But if we really want to know what God is saying to us, each one of us, where do we find that? In the Bible. And we should read it every day, right? Try to. Yeah, at least try to. Okay, now, because of one of the things that Martin Luther helped us understand is we don't need somebody to pray for us. We're going to fold our hands, and we're going to pray directly to God. He's going to listen to each one of you, each one of us, individually, because he loves us all. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for the free gift of salvation through the death and the resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ. Help us to live by faith in Jesus, and to trust that you love us just the way we are, and help us to tell everybody, everywhere, what a wonderful, loving Father you are, and that salvation is your free gift to them too. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, guys. Great job. We continue with the next hymn, 845. <clears throat> Mercy and peace be multiplied in you from God our Father.
and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We pray that your word is uh, uplifted in our hearts today. Challenge us and encourage us, Father, by your activity in the world, by your activity in our lives. Help us to hear and live out your truth. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. <clears throat> it's interesting today that we are still in the upward angle or the uh, inward angle talking about what is a missional congregation and how it's not just going out there, it's also making sure our worship is in the right priority in our lives, that it's more than just attending a worship ceremony on a Sunday morning, but living out worship throughout all of our lives. If you look at the Reformation, it almost seems like we wouldn't want to talk about this today Almost because, just like this young boy said, well, he created division in the church. And it's true, he did. But I've also got to tell you that that was not his intent and actually almost stopped him from doing any of the acts that he did. You see, he didn't want the church split. He was hesitant about speaking up. The 95 Theses that we talk about that he nails to the door... That wasn't an act of rebellion. That door was like a bulletin board. He's saying, these are the 95 things that I want to sit down and debate with somebody. I, I want to discuss them. I, I don't want to make this stand. I don't want to break the church up. But also at the same time, the printing press had been developed. Somebody took those 95 theses down, and they had them printed and dispersed. Not Luther. See, he understand, understood that there's a uniqueness that happens in the body of Christ. There is something, when we as a church come together and unite around the gospel. The Bible says you're not your own. You've been bought with a price. And this isn't just that we go out then and live like lone, uh, people who are alone. Because when God redeems you, he redeems you into a fellowship, into connection with people. Several years ago, I've actually hiked here twice now. First, when I was working on my doctorate, I drove up from Pasadena where I was uh, having classes. And last time, I, I took a group from Colorado, and we hiked around these, the sequoias. And when you see trees like this, they're some of the oldest and largest in the entire world. A and you wonder, how can trees that some of them date back 25 years, 2,500 years, remain standing after all the storms? They actually have a very shallow root system. Not what you would think for trees that are this large. I, I think one of us, I think it took all 16 of us holding hands as far as we could apart to get around the tree. But the root system is shallow. But the reason they remain strong is because it actually reaches out to the next sequoia and wraps its roots around them. So all of these trees are interconnected underneath the ground. And that's actually what has held this forest up for all these years. There's actually only two sequoia forests in the world. I've hiked them both, one in California and one in Australia. They're both amazing. But what's ma more amazing is that they've stayed up together because of their interconnectedness. I want to talk to you this morning about the unique relationship that we have in the church. Psalm 133 says, you know, behold, gaze, gaze upon the body of believers. Your Bibles, turn to Psalm 133, verse 1. Psalm 133, verse 1. Psalmist writes this, behold, how good and pleasant it is for brothers to dwell in unity. Is like the precious oil upon the head 
coming down the beard, even Aaron's beard, coming down from the edge of the robes. It is like the dew of Hermon coming down upon the mountains of Zion. He actually uses the phrase twice in the Hebrew here. Stop. Stop and behold. Stop and look at this. I want you to see something that the psalmist sees as powerful. How good it is when brothers and sisters get together and dwell in unity. Now, I want us to understand it's not uniformity. Unity is not uniformity. We actually confuse that in our our denomination, the LCMS, a lot. We all got to do it the same way, the same style. That's not necessarily what we're saying here. Unity isn't talking about the way you worship. We have different styles here. Actually, to be honest with you, I don't care about the way you worship. I love both styles. I love when you guys stand up like you did this morning and you find a hymn where, like, thy uh, strong word does cleave in darkness. And I'm sitting up here and I don't even have to sing because I'm blessed by listening to you. I'm blessed when the late service starts worshiping, singing a modern worship song. Unity isn't about the style of worship you have. Unity isn't about the type of church you have. Unity is the relationships that you and I have that we recognize are based upon our relationship to Jesus Christ. When you and I got baptized, we were baptized into a family. We were baptized into a relationship with each other. I don't get the opportunity to say, I don't want to be in relationship with you. And sorry, you don't get that opportunity with me either. You simply don't. So even as we said last week, we used last week the illustration of a rock polisher. That those rocks beating up against each other, and in that polisher, they lose their edges, and our lives are meant to be that for each other. I want to use another illustration today. But I want to use the illustration of a spider's web. A couple of reasons for that. Years ago when I was working on my doctorate, my thesis was in leadership since my doctorate's in leadership. And, and I was theorizing of a new leadership style based upon a spider web. You see, modernity has built leadership styles based upon like a wall. You know, you have the leadership, and everything is built. Everything's nice and organized. Well, the world we live in now is not that organized. And, and so I looked at the uniqueness of the spider web, and in fact, 20 years ago when I was doing, even the architectural students were looking at a spider web because they began to consider to, how do you design buildings like a spider web because it's so strong. So why would I look at the church like a spider web? Do you know you realize you can break one strand of spider's web but you never lose the integrity of the web? The rest of the web will hold it together and hold it strong, and the next strand is not any weaker. So how do we in a the church live in a way that our lives are so interconnected? You know, another thing about a spider's web, you can't tell where the beginning is nor the end. It's kind of really what it should be in the body of Christ. It's not about pastor. You guys have been able to grow. You've been able to mature spiritually. You've been able to move ahead in the church without having a full-time pastor. Because the concept that the church really is a gathering of God's saints to live out his will, maybe that is sinking in about this life together. Christian brotherhood is not an ideal which we must realize. It's rather a reality created by God in Christ in which you and I participate. There's a little book. If you ever get a chance to read it, it's the best book I've ever written or ever read about the relationship in the church. It's about a German pastor by the name of Dietrich Bonhoeffer who was arrested in the concentration camps and that was executed right before the end of World War II. Bonhoeffer writes this, Human love can never understand spiritual love. For spiritual love is from above. It's something completely strange, new. 
and incomprehensible to all earthly love. Human love attempts to dominate another person. Spiritual love is freeing the other person. Human love constructs his, its own image of another person, of what he is and what he should become. It takes the life of the other person into his own hands. Spiritual love recognizes the true image of the other person, which is received from Jesus Christ. The image that Jesus Christ embodied and would stamp upon all men. What that simply means, guys, in the church, relationship should be freeing. It should be enhancing. It actually should propel us to a whole new level in our spirituality. If you look at Hebrews 11 in your Bibles, here's what you find. Turn to Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11 is a chapter. It talks about, in Hebrew, how we're in a stadium, and we have all the saints of old up in the stadium. The problem is, when we read it, we tend to think they're all looking down on us. The truth is, that's not how it works. The people in heaven are not looking down upon us. He's using the illustration of looking up to, to them. And, and as I look up to the saints, who do I see? I see the story. I see... Noah, yes, a man of faith, but also a drunk. I see the story of Daniel. Yes, he was saved from the lion's den, but, but even more than that, when they asked him to bow the knee before the pagan gods, he said, I won't. I look up and I see St. Paul. And you read in Acts 7. How they stoned the first believer, uh, first martyr named Stephen. And as they're stoning it, they take the, the outer cloaks of those who are going to do the stoning and they lay them at the feet of a young man named Saul. And then I hear in Acts 9 how this young man is going out and persecuting the church and, and then he runs into Christ and his life changes forever. And I read the rest of Acts, and it's a story about what God had done, has done in the first church. But do you know the book of Acts actually never ends? Do you realize you're still living the book of Acts? Because the book of Acts would wrap into it the story of Martin Luther. Not a monk who divided the church. Not a monk who walked around with a chip on his shoulder, a man who was actually broken, a, a man who would go up into his upper room and literally beat himself unconscious because his faith of the day told him that he needed to suffer for his sins. A man who began to prepare a lecture in a tower for his class in Romans, illuminated by the Holy Spirit to see the just will live in faith. And because that mo in that moment the Holy Spirit enlightened something in his heart, something the church needed, he went out not as a reformer. You see, he didn't go out to do it. But God, who was working in history, put him at the right time. Knox, years before, was burned at the stake for the same thing Luther was trying to do. He was actually in the work for the reformer who was to come. And all of these stories are our stories interconnected. You can go back to this whole Hebrews chapter and read them. In the beginning it talks about those that don't know. But go to verse 32. And what more shall I say? For the time will fail me if I tell you of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David, Samuel, the prophets, who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, promises when the mouths of lions were shut. Some faced jeers, some faced floggings. The word floggings there in Greek literally means to be stretched out. They were stretched out as far as they could be those first century believers and whipped to death. 
They were cut in two. Dragged, drugged through the streets like Thomas in India. But you see, these stories are not our own. And neither is yours. We have to grasp that our stories are each other's stories, melded together in the story of Christ. You know, I, I found it interesting. <clears throat> Last night, going over my sermon, n- no, I don't write them the night before. But I do go over them. And I had to ask myself, and I can tell you, I don't know the answer to this. Today's confirmation day, and we're having it in the second service. And we have four students <clears throat> stand up and give their stories, their faith statements. And I thought, if our stories are interconnected, how come we're only letting them be heard by half the congregation? I don't know the answer to that. And it may be something that we have to grapple with before next year's. Maybe it's the kids need to come in. And at least be in part of the first service. Because they're, they're standing up today to proclaim their faith that is theirs, not just their parents. And if you and I are connected by our stories, we're connected by their stories as well. And yet, only half of us will hear their stories today. Again, I don't have an answer to that. It's more of a question. But that's how connected we are. 1 Corinthians 11, we read last week about the body of Christ and and, uh, about how some of us are one part of the body and others are another part. And how one part can't say to the other, we have no need of you. And the other part can't say, I need you because we are all interconnected. You have a role to play in this community. A role in each other's lives. Yesterday, yesterday I had two funerals. I was at one and then I had to run to the other. One of those was sad, was a, a person who worshipped here. But what blessed me was early in the day, one of your members came up to me and said how when this person came here, they were lost. They were lost in their life and lost in their own struggles. But over a matter of time, faith in this place. They found fulfillment. They found strength in the relationship they had with other people. Because God is creating and uniting you in this web together at times when you don't even realize it. We said last week, you don't know the pain of the person sitting next to you. You don't know the struggle. And the body of Christ should be the place where you walk into in the love and mercy of Christ and begin to develop those relationships that are much deeper. For your joys are my joys and your pains are my pains. Hebrews 10 says, do not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us Encourage one another. I got to tell you, one of the biggest struggles right now for pastors, because I'm in a, obviously I have a different kind of ministry. And and one of the ministries God has given me is to meet with other pastors to try to encourage them and build them up. To mentor them. And the biggest struggle pastors are having today is what's happening in their churches as people have not come back. And they're trying, how do we recreate community? How do we recreate those bonds in this place? Now, we've been blessed to have most of you come back, but there's still some that aren't. And when you're not in the body of Christ, you're missing something. Yes, you are forgiven, saved, and going to heaven one day. But do you realize your salvation is not just about heaven? It's not just about where your eternity ends up. It's about God was what God is doing and formulating in your life right here and right now. It's the activity of God's kingdom in this world. 
We have made Christianity too much about the afterlife. Yes, we should all be excited. Yes, there's glory that awaits. But there's abundant life to be lived out now. There's a reality of God's presence given us through the cross of Jesus to be fleshed out with each other right now. And you need each other. Henry Henry Nowen says this, we are unified by our common weaknesses, our common failures, our common disappointments, and our common inconsistencies. He's simply saying we are a broken group together. It's what it is. Bonhoeffer later says this about our needs for each other. He said, he needs his brother as a bearer and proclaimer of the divine word of salvation. He needs his brother solely because of Jesus Christ. The Christ in his own heart is weaker than the Christ in the word of his brother. His own heart is uncertain. His brother is sure. What he's saying there, there's a times that the Christ in me needs the Christ in you. Do you understand that? The Christ in me needs the Christ in you. Because at that moment, I am weaker. At that moment, I can't stand up. I got a call this week from another family friend whose father this week died on the operating table. And and what this brother needed was the Christ in me. He didn't need necessarily a preacher. He needed the Christ that I bear inside of me. He needed to have hope spoken into a situation because there wasn't much chance that this person was going to die, and yet they did. They didn't need all my wisdom and all my years of schooling. They simply needed the Christ inside of me to remind them of the hope of eternal glory in that moment. You are bearers of the light. You have been given as a gift to each other. Your stories are not your own. Your stories propel me to a whole different place in my walk. And my story should propel you. And our stories together, under Christ, drive this church. Gary Bird says it this way, when God's love feels distant or non-existent, the body of Christ's love is real and tangible. You become to me the very presence of God. That's what a church is. That's the kind of relationship we're striving to be with each other. Guys, we're living in a postmodern world, and most of us still have no idea what that means. Although you live it out every day. But listen to this. The best we have to offer this post-Christendom world is the quality of our relationships, the power of our trustworthiness, and the wonder of our generosity. By post-Christendom, it's really simple. Constantine, when he was in charge, he actually started Christendom, because he was the first believer who became emperor. He actually brought in all the barbarians, threw them in the water, and baptized everybody and said, now we have a Christian empire. He didn't, but he proclaimed it was. But what he did is he took the church from the edges, and he put it in the center of culture, and that's exactly the way we designed the whole country. We designed our country and the concept of Christendom. Go out east where I'm from. Every village, when it first came to be, what was in the center of that village? Church. We're no longer in Christendom, and the church is no longer the center of the world. We are back on the edges. Edges of culture, the edges of society. And I'm sorry, but I'm not so sure it's that bad. But there, as everybody looks at us, what we have to offer them is our relationships, our generosity, the quality of what they see in Jesus Christ fleshed out in this place as they stand in awe of wonder of what God is doing in our midst. As God creates these relationships in a unique place that people long for. For when you walk in this door on Sunday morning, it's not about, do I have my life together? Because you don't. 
It's not about have I overcome all the problems in my life because you haven't. It's broken sinners walking in together to link arms, to once again remember what Jesus has done for us as a family, and that we go forth to live that out. Because today, just like in the first century, just like at the Reformation, God is still writing his story. He's still putting the words together. You know, the last words of the book that I wrote that you'll get in a couple weeks, I said, I tell you, the story in Haiti is the story that we find ourselves in. The book of Acts is a story today that you find yourself in. May God grant you the mercy to live it faithfully. In Jesus' name, amen. You may remain seated as the uh, choir kind of moves towards the back. We're thankful and blessed again to uh, have our choir after how many years? <laughs> I don't know. All this journey. So, yes, let's give them a hand.
we stand for prayer? <clears throat> o Lord, who stands firm for us, keep us strong in our faith and help us to trust you boldly in our thoughts, words, and deeds. May we never waver in our connection to your word or stray from your way for us. O sure foundation. O Lord, who clings tightly to the truth, thank you for the life of Martin Luther and all the reformers who opened the path to uncovering the truth of our salvation, won first solely by Jesus through his death on the cross and resurrection from the dead. Give us the confidence to share the good news of salvation with others. Jesus is the word made flesh and the redeemer of all. O oh Lord, confident against all foes, strengthens in our battles with sin and Satan, and gives us support we need to remain steady from all attacks against us and against you. With you at, with you at our right hand, O short creation. O Lord, protect us in the source of comfort and blessing. When we find ourselves afraid and uncertain of what lies before us, O sure O Lord, who gives us his holy scriptures to guide us in his word. And through your word, give us with the help we need to make it through every twist and turn of every given day. O sure foundation. O Lord, who has gone to prepare a place for us in heaven, ready signs for the time that is to come. When we sing your word, all the saints in light. O sure Heavenly Father, we lift before you this day all those, Lord God, who need a touch from your hand of mercy. Lord, continue to be with Bill as he struggles, Lord God, with uh, physical debilitation. Lord, as you find to him in Bill's life. Lord, we pray for the family of Amanda, who went home. We thank you, God, that your grace is not dependent upon us or even our, our actions. Lord, that even when we lose our way, it doesn't mean that we've lost you. Strengthen this family and her children with your love and mercy. Be, Lord God, with the uh, the family of love, another one that so many of some of us knew. We celebrate his life as he returns to you, O oh God. We lift the family of John Roth, our teacher and member at Trinity, who entered into rest this week. Be with his wife, his children, and grandchildren. Comfort them. Lord, this day we remember all the saints. And all the loved ones who've gone on before us, who already are gathered before your throne, keep in your perfect peace, Lord, as we pray together the prayer of your Son. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our treasured bread as we forgive the trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power forever and ever. You may be seated. <clears throat> On the night when Christ was betrayed, he took it, blessed it, and he broke it. He gave to them, saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Later on, after supper, he took the cup. He said, take and drink. This cup is a new covenant. My blood poured out for the forgiveness of all your sins. Every time you drink, remember me. You're invited to once again share in the peace, love, and mercy of God in the sacrament. We come in his peace. Amen. Take and
The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of God stands forever. May the Lord of everlasting power bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his might to shine upon you. Lord, lift his glory upon you, and may he grant you peace. Now, this is the time in the Reformation service, you get to sing the Reformation hymn. Not just because it's a good hymn, but because the Reformation is us about us finding that fortress and living in God's love. And knowing that even when we get the message wrong at times, the message never has changed. God has loved you in Jesus Christ, and he loves this world in Jesus Christ. That's what we're to be, and that's what we're to live. Let's sing together. time I sing that hymn, I remember of a little green stick figure that I used to watch on TV as a kid. Some of you will remember if you want. <laughs>
You may be seated to go and serve the Lord.